Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much uh, to the organizers for giving me this opportunity to share our results with all of you, and especially also to the proto 19 Alliance for um, funding some of our research on this topic. Um, I'm very humbled after seeing these videos. I've had to fight back tears, and I'm very jet-lagged, so I apologize in advance if this is a bit not as nice as I would like it to be. Anyway, today I'm going to give you an overview of many of the results that we have generated regarding proto 19 in the last couple of years in my, since I started my own laboratory. And as you all probably know, proto 19 is a cell-cell addition protein. It's, it sits at the cell membrane and mediates recognition and addition between different cells. And uh, mutations in this X-linked uh, gene, they manifest with seizures and other neurological symptoms in uh, affected heterozygous females. But however, um, males that have a mutation in this gene are usually spared. And because of this very unusual inheritance uh, mode, it was postulated that this uh, disease might be caused by a phenomenon called uh, cellular interference, where the coexistence of wild type of normal and mutated cells uh, has a detrimental effect on the tissue level, even if individual cells are uh, themselves not affected. And indeed, uh, the recent data from uh, our colleagues in Australia have uh, shown very nice evidence that this um, theory might indeed be correct. So what we are doing with regards to uh, protocadiline 19 is focusing mostly on the cortex. And if you look at this graph and just focus on the dark spots, these are cells that express the protocadiline 19 gene. And these are... Uh, um, pieces of the cerebral cortex at different uh, ages in the, in the mouse. And you can see that there are always these dark spots there. So protocadiline 19 is expressed by neurons in the, in the cortex. And before I move on uh, into explaining more, um, I will give you a very brief introduction on the cortex so that you can follow better the um, data that I will present later on. The interesting thing about this is that because of the lack of suitable ways of recognizing the protein, and also probably because of where within the neurons this protein is located, it has been very, very difficult to get any information on uh, what exactly these neurons are, what type of neurons they are. We know their uh, location, but we don't know other things about them. What other uh, markers do they express? Where these neurons are projecting to? Which other neurons they're making contact with? So this is one of the things that uh, I will be talking very briefly about before I move to the, to the mouse model itself. So very briefly about the cortex. So the cerebral cortex is this highly convoluted structure that you see when you first look at a human brain. And in mice, it's, it's not convoluted, it's smooth. However, the way the neurons are distributed is the same, both in humans and mouse and in all uh, mammalian species. And the neurons in the cortex are organized into layers, as you can see there in the center. And these layers, they group neurons that share common properties. They might have similar morphologies, they project to the same other regions in the brain, they have similar functions. So. The cortex has six layers, only five of them contain neurons because layer one, which is the one at the top, doesn't contain any neurons. Neurons in layer six and layer five, which are uh, called or considered the lower layer neurons, they project outside of the cortex. So neurons in layer six, they connect the cortex with a different brain structure that it's called the thalamus. And neurons in layer five, they project to other regions of the brain that are not the thalamus and also to the spinal cord. And the neurons in layers two, three, and four, which are collectively called the upper layers, they project within the cortex, mostly. Layer four is an input layer, so the information that has to go to the cortex goes to the neurons in layer four and is then distributed, and the neurons in layers two and three, they connect within the cortex. That's a general picture, and it's not 100% accurate because not every single neuron in the deep layers is going to project outside of the cortex. And this is important because when we see a population of neurons that expresses, in this case, protocadiline 19, we don't know exactly what these neurons are. So how do we characterize neurons? We use something that is called cortical markers. And as you can see in this uh, blue and pinkish uh, image, these are uh, genes or proteins that are expressed either by particular types of neurons 
or by neurons that are in particular layers. So if we go to look for these markers, we can try to understand what the neurons are or get a better idea of what they're doing and what is their function. And the ones that I will be talking about are um, CAX1, which is a, a marker that is expressed in all of the upper layers, so in layers 2, 3, and 4. Rol beta is a marker that is expressed very uh, specifically by neurons in layer 4. And then mm, very, very faintly at the very top of layer 5. Then we have CTIP2, which is the quintessential marker for neurons that project to the spinal cord. Um, neurons in the lower part of layer 5 are strongly positive for CTIP2, and then neurons in layer 6 are faintly positive. For layer 6, we have TBR1, and then these are all essentially layer markers, except for CTIP2 that defines a particular type. And then we have SATP2, which labels these cells that project within the cortex. And as you can see there, it will label most of the cells, if not all, in the upper layers, but we will also have some in the deep layers as well. So with all of this in mind, I'm going to show you two slides of results trying to figure out uh, what, the, what are the markers are expressed by neurons that also express protocadirin 19. So what you have here are um, images that we have taken from brains, from mouse brains, that are 10 days old. So this is uh, early postnatal, postnatal animals, and they are in the process of establishing their circuits. If you look at the red signal in all the images, this is detection of protocadirin 19 uh, mRNA, so a nucleic acid. Uh, we cannot at the moment use antibodies to detect the protein because they don't work in our hands or I don't think they work in any hands. So what we are detecting here is the nucleic acid that codes for protocadirin 19. And what we have done is combined this with an antibody against SADB2, which I just said are those neurons that pro uh, labels those neurons that project within the cortex. And looking at the red signal, what you see is that the, mo the most red you will see in layer 5 and at the very top of the cortex, at the top of layer 2, 3. So when we combine it with SADB2, what we see is that, not surprisingly, all those cells at the, at the very top, they also express SADB2. This is to be expected. However, we can find some neurons that do not express SADB2, and we're in the process of trying to identify what those neurons are. There must be a different type of neuron. If we then uh, focus into layer 5, which is at the moment the most interesting because it shows the highest expression, what we see is that we have these very, very strongly positive cells for protocadirin 19, and most of them, they also co-express SADB2. And this is not trivial, because in layer 5, most of the neurons will not necessarily project within the cortex. We can also see, if we go uh, down to 5B, that some neurons are positive for protocadirin 19, but not for SADB2. So we decided to check whether there might be any neurons expressing protocadirin 19 projecting away from the cortex. And we repeated the same experiment using instead an antibody against CTIP2. And as you can see on the right, Indeed, we find several um, neurons that co-express protocadirin 19 and CTIP2. However, our analysis or our estimate of where layer 5A and 5B is, it was based on the morphology of the neurons, because layer 4 neurons are small and they're very tightly cramped together, and this is how we had defined it. But we uh, then decided to use raw beta and combine it with CTIP2. And in this, in the long, tall image, what you see is in blue, this is a raw beta, so these are the neurons in layer 4. And in green, we have CTIP2, and you see this um, bunch of, of very strong green cells below the blue ones, and in between there is a gap. And this gap is layer 5A. And indeed, with this experiment, we could confirm that the strongest expression of protocadirin 19 is in neurons in layer 5A. And Looking into more detail, we have seen that there, this is a heterogeneous population. So within there, if you look at C, D, and E, you will find that there are cells that express protocadirin 19 and do not express uh, CTIP2 or Rorbita. Some co-express protocadirin 19 and CTIP2, but not Rorbita. And some are faintly positive for Rorbita, negative for CTIP2, 
and positive for protocatibility 19. And I know this is a bunch of, of names of genes and so on, but the take home message from this is neurons that express protocatibility 19 are not a homogeneous population. And it is worth uh, going into more detail and trying to find what those neurons are and where they are connecting to, because they might be involved in different types of circuits. It's not just one population doing all the same thing. So with this, I'm going to um, turn into, an, I will keep talking about these markers in the context of trying to characterize the protocadurin 19 mouse model. And this was already done a couple of years ago. Uh, and it was um, published that there were no big differences, no gross anatomical differences in the morphology of the cortex between um, normal animals and animals lacking protocardiogen 19. And we decided to count the neurons because sometimes there might be slight differences of maybe 10 or 20 percent that cannot be really appreciated by eye. You really need to count those cells. And we also wanted to, to look closely at the distribution in the cortex. We did not expect necessarily to find any um, big differences, but which we haven't found, uh, that's a, a spoiler alert, but um, we, have, we are not finished yet with the different types of cells. So the way we're doing that is we cross um, males that are not mutants, with a uh, heterozygous female. So mouse, uh, female mice that have one uh, copy mutated and one normal copy. And that gives us litters of animals that have wild type males and females, knockout males and heterozygous females. And that allows us to do a comparison between litter mates to avoid other sources of variation, maybe within litters and so on. Mm -hmm. So when these animals are 10 days old, we harvest the brains, we cut them, and we stain them for these markers that I have mentioned before. Of course, we cannot count every single cell in the brain because that would be, that would take forever. So we have decided to focus on one region, which is the somatosensory cortex, which is the part of the cortex that receives the information about touch. And in the mouse, it is very well characterized and it has a very particular structure. So we get these slices that you can see on the right, and then we start counting and we count all of the green dots and we count all of the red dots, and then we, also, you cannot see it there very well, but we also have blue, which labels all of the cells. So with this, what we can determine is, out of all the cells that are in the somatosensory cortex, how many of them express CAX1 in the normal situation, in the heterozygous animals, or in the knockout animals? Same for CTIP2. And then we also artificially divide this into 10 equal bins, and we say, what is the percentage of CAX1 expressing cells in bin 1, in bin 2, in bin 3, and in this way we can very accurately look at numbers and distributions of neurons. So we have done this so far, it's not 100% complete because it's sometimes difficult to get everything to work and we always miss one type of animal to really have enough to do a statistical analysis, but we have done this uh, for four markers at the moment, so CAX1 and CT2, and as you can see there, we don't see any big changes in total numbers or in percentage of, of the total population that expresses one marker or the other, and we also don't see changes in the distribution. And what this is telling us is that there doesn't seem to be any issues with the neurons being generated in the proper proportions and moving to their, to their correct position in the brain. As you can see there, uh, these are the data for CAX1 and CTIP2, and we have done that as well for uh, SATB2 and Rorbita. Um, before anyone asks, this little uh, red peak that kind of stands out uh, in Rorbita, we think it's due to a methodological issue, and we're working to redo those samples because it has to do with, well, with the method itself. So, the other thing that we have done with these animals, and that has um, given us really interesting results, and actually we, this is relatively recent, is we have looked at their behavior. And we have done it at two different ages. When they are 20 days one old, and these are uh, very young mice that are still with their mothers, and then we look <clears throat> later on when they are adults, so when they are 60 days old or older. And the first test that we did was the open field. And this is a very easy test. You just take a mouse and you put it into an arena, essentially a box. And then you track how much distance this animal moves in a period of 20 minutes. And what we do is we do that when they are 20 days one old, 
And after 24 hours, we repeat that again. Because the first time that you put them in, they might be altered, anxious. So it is a better readout to do it twice to see um, what happens when that is not the, the really novel and stressful situation that they are encountering. And then we repeat it at P60. And we do that because if we were to find differences at P60, we would be interested to know, is this something that was there before? So is this something that um, is mediated developmentally or it is something that only affects adults? And, and the other way around, we might find something at P21 that disappears at P60 because it kind of get com gets compensated as the mouse gets older. So we looked at this and these are the results. And what we found was that Males showed no difference. Uh, they uh, traveled the same amount of distance, um, both in trial one and trial two at P21, so at 21 days of age. But what we found was that heterozygous females were more active than wild type females at both, uh, in both trials. And this uh, we have repeated with enough animals to be able to do a statistical analysis, and this difference is statistically significant. So it uh, seems to be a real uh, difference what we're seeing here. Uh, what we also found was that when we compared the first trial with the second trial, both wild type and heterozygous females move less. And essentially what this is showing is that these animals get used to it. This is called habituation. So on the second day, they are more familiar with being put in the box and then uh, they move less. And this happens both for wild types and heterozygous females. Then we checked at P60 and this difference seemed to disappear. We, could, we couldn't find any statistical uh, difference or statistically backed difference uh, between heterozygous females and wild type females. And again, the males also showed no difference. But what we found was that at this stage, when we compare trial one and trial two, there is no habituation because essentially these animals have already been subjected to this test twice when they were P21. So when you put them back at P60, because these are the same animals that we track and, and uh, subject to the test again, they're not, they don't find it as novel probably. So they don't habituate. So we wanted to understand what which were the factors that could explain the difference between heterozygous and wild type females at P21? And the, the th things that we could think about was, well, maybe they're more anxious, maybe they're hyperactive, or maybe they have an increased reaction to a novel environment. So to test for anxiety, we first went back to our open field uh, results, and we analyzed them in a different manner. Because the other data that you can get from this test is, how much of the, how much time or how much distance this animal is spending at the periphery of the box and how much it is spending in the center. And mice, they uh, like to be, let's say, they feel more protected if they're close to a wall. And anyone who's tried to chase one will see that they try to go to the walls and run along them. So if an animal is anxious, it will stay closer to the walls. And if it is less anxious, it will explore more and it will, uh, as a consequence, uh, travel more distance in the center. So we can use the time in the center as a readout for anxiety, or at least that's the way it is interpreted. So what we checked was how much time do our female animals spend in the center of the box versus the periphery? And if, the, if that time is decreased, it would mean that they're more anxious, but this is not what we found we didn't find any statistically significant difference between the time that uh, wild type uh, females spent in the periphery and the center and head females uh, spent in the periphery and the center. So this uh, kind of ruled out the possibility of anxiety. But we did a second test, which is called the elevated plasmase, where you take a mouse and you put that, you put it into a structure that is like a plus shape and two of the arms are covered and have walls and two are open. And it is the same principle. If an animal is more anxious, it will spend more time in the closed arms. And if it is less anxious, it will like uh, to explore in the open arms as well. So again, we can use the amount of time that the animal spends in the open arms as a readout uh, of whether it is more anxious or not. So for example, uh, what we see here is if there is more time spent in open arms, that means less anxiety. 
we did that at uh, P21 and P60, and this is what we found. And actually, it's the opposite of what a study T would look like, because our heterozygous female spent significantly more time in the open arms. So we conclude from these two experiments that our heterozygous females are not more anxious than the uh, wild type ones. So if they're moving more, or they are, if they're showing increased anxiety at P21 in the open field test, it's not because they're more anxious. To test for activity, here we have a problem, because we need to test for long enough that any effects of a novel environment will not influence the results. And we cannot separate the P21 pups from their mothers for so long because this test, essentially what it looks is at the activity of the animals over a period of 24 hours. So we could only do that at P60. We put them into a, into a cage that has infrared beams. It has three of those. And as the animal moves around, it will intercept those beams. And the number of beam breaks is then uh, considered as a measure of activity. And during these 24 hours that the mouse is in the cage, 12 of those hours there is light, which, which, which would be the not active period for a nocturnal animal like the mouse, and 12 hours will be in the dark, which is their active period. And when we looked at the results, again, we see no um, differences between heterozygous and, female, um, and knockout females. In the total brim breaks over a 24-hour period, there is no difference. And if we look uh, in the light hours and dark hours, again, no difference. So this, of course, is in uh, adult animals. So we don't know whether there would be a difference in the, in the young ones, but we cannot test for it. But we thought, let's have a look and see whether maybe there is an increased reaction to a novel environment. And to that, we already had the data that we needed because it's, again, data that we can get from our open field experiment. What we do is, instead of analyzing the data as a whole over a 20-minute period, we check uh, what has been the activity in five-minute intervals, in the first five minutes, in the second half, uh, five minutes, and so on. And of course, what you would expect is, if the animal is reacting to a novel environment, it will do so at the beginning because after 20 minutes, it's more used to it. So this is what you would expect. And this is indeed uh, what we find. What we found was that the main difference between wild type and head females that we could see in the global 20 minute period, essentially is uh, due to changes in the first five minutes. And when we plot that, what we see is that in the first trial, we see this habituation for, um, from the first to the second five minutes. They start very uh, moving a, lo a lot around, and then slowly they reach kind of a baseline level of activity. But then in trial two, the wild type females, they're not uh, doing that anymore, but the head females are. And to our surprise, that was also the case at P60. So even if we couldn't see a difference in the, in, during the whole 20 minutes, we could still see the same effect in the adult animals. So essentially, what we're seeing here is that whenever you put a protocadrin 90 heterozygous mouse into an open field box, it will act as if it doesn't know it, as if it has never been there, and it will be hyperactive compared with a, with a wild type animal. Okay? And every single time that we've done, so over the four trials that we have done, we see this effect. So what we conclude from this is that protocadrin 19 heterozygous female mice, they show hypersensitivity uh, to novel environments. And because I'm not a clinician, for me it would be very interesting to, to hear from you whether um, female patients also show some type, any type of hypersensitivity to maybe sensory stimuli, to novel environments. I don't know. Of course, these are mice, and we cannot completely translate the results that we get in mice to humans. But it could be very interesting because this is also giving us a readout, uh, something that is different that we can then try to correct or try to see what cir particular circuit is mediating this. So this is uh, something that we're going to start uh, soon. And of course, the other thing is that these differences are reflecting changes in the brain. Maybe circuits that are wired differently or that function differently. So to start getting an idea of um, what can be the role of protocadrin 19 at that level, we decided to use um, embryonic stem cell derived neurons to look uh, for the role in synaptogenesis and in synaptic function. 
So here we go from the whole animal to a cell level again. And our uh, model has been to use this protocatin 19 knockout mouse and use it to derive um, embryonic stem cells, which I will call ESLs from now on. And we had also ESLs uh, from a mouse that expresses, that is a transgenic mouse where the neurons are labeled green. All neurons express a green fluorescent protein. So if we culture these ESLs and we derive them and we, we make them convert into neurons, we can then mix them to generate this um, mixed background that would be the, the um, hypothesis uh, that is our working hypothesis, that it is when the two populations coexist, when the issues arise. The good thing is that we can then distinguish which are the wild type uh, neurons and which are the knockout neurons. Of course, first we had to check whether in our differentiation protocol, the neurons that we obtain express protocatin 19, because if they don't, then there's no point in doing the analysis. We did first a quick check, and out of these three lines, the first one from the left is the, uh, our ESL-derived neurons. So we saw that they expressed it. So we did a, a deeper analysis, checking for the quantitative levels of the protocatin 19 mRNA, these are, these are the blue uh, columns. What we see is that there is a steady increase in the expression of this gene as the neurons are being generated and mature. And we have also checked um, at the protein level. And even though the protein results are from just one differentiation, what we see is that we can see uh, good levels of protocadurin 19 at least from day eight onwards. And it's important to say what we're looking at here is the endogenous protocadurin 19. We're not overexpressing. We're looking at the one that those cells are expressing. We're not adding any extra. Um, so since then, we've been uh, routinely generating neurons from our both wild type and knockout ES cells. And our protocol generates, or the one that we've been following so far, generates excitatory neurons that are similar to neurons from the cerebral cortex which is uh, what we're interested in. So what you see there is in the first panel, uh, the red um, dots are um, VGLUT1 expressing uh, neurons, and VGLUT1 is a transporter for glutamate, so that is a label for excitatory neurons. And we have also been able to uh, obtain neurons that express SADV2, uh, CTIP2, CAX1, so the same type of neurons that we are dealing with when we have the tissue, we can generate in vitro. And uh, the lower part of the slide shows our co-cultures. So the way we're doing them is we keep knockout and wild type separated until the point where you, where you play them for them to start making neurons. So we're not looking here at whether they will segregate from each other. It has been recently published. What we're trying to generate is a system where we forced knockout and wild type neurons to coexist very nicely mixed. Because that way we can then check, we, we do this, and then of course we keep knockout and wild type separated as controls. And what we are starting to do is count how many synapses are formed. Because we are interested to see whether protocadrin 19 is necessary for the establishment of, of these contacts in between neurons. Uh, we don't have those data yet because that is a very um, labor intensive thing. But the other thing that we've uh, done is the calcium imaging. And we are doing this because we need to know whether these neurons that we are generating are real neurons that are able to respond to stimuli and to connect to each other. And the way we do that is with a dye that is called FURA2. And FURA2 is a substance that will change its fluorescent properties when it associates with calcium. And one thing, um, so when neurons are excited, by a, by a stimulus, that will cause a depolarization of the membrane, and they have channels that open when that happens and allow calcium to enter to the cell. So whenever there is neuronal activity, the concentration of calcium within the neuron will increase. Therefore, if we use this uh, dye, we can use uh, the changes in the FURA2 intensity as a readout, as an indirect measure for neuronal activity. <coughs> And what you can see uh, in the images is these are neurons that have been loaded with the dye, and then we can select them individually. And the, uh, it's a computerized system, and they will be tracked. So you add something to the cells, and you check whether the intensity in each of these little circles changes. 
And we did that for our wild type and our knockout ESL derived neurons. And what we could see is that they were real neurons that were responding to KCL treatment. So if you artificially increase the concentration of, of potassium chloride in the outside of the cell, that causes depolarization of the neuron. So it's a way of mimicking neuronal activity. And what we see is that every time that we add um, potassium chloride, we get a spike in the intensity of calcium. So these neurons are responding properly. The other thing that this shows us is that they're healthy neurons, and then we wash it out, they go down, we add it again, they respond again. If they were dying, these responses would go down until the point where you don't see any. So this is important because it allows us to do other type of experiments knowing that we have healthy neurons. For those of you who are more observant, the other thing that we found here was that knockout neurons seem to have a smaller response when we added the KCL than wild type. So what we did was repeat this experiment several times with different, um, but with taking ear cells and converting them into neurons on separate occasions to have independent experiments to see uh, whether this was a real effect. And uh, it is, that's uh, what we have found. When we culture them separately, what we found is that the response to KCL is much bigger uh, in the wild type neurons than in the knockout neurons. And of course, the next question was, what happens if we have the co-culture? And um, the good thing for us is that we are able, as you can see in the image at the very right, we are able to distinguish in our co-culture experiments, thanks to the green fluorescent protein, we can do the same experiment and know if our little circles are in an, on a knockout cell or on a wild type cell. And what you can see there is that when we co-culture them, suddenly those differences disappear. And both wild type and knockout neurons show the same amplitude, which is indeed fairly close to what the knockout neurons show. And again, these are recent experiments, so we don't really know why this is happening. We're starting to look at calcium channels and other uh, intrinsic properties of the neurons because this is a very interesting finding for us to see how the co-culture of wild type and knockout cells can somehow influence the behavior of the wild type cells as well. So finally, I want to give you an um, overview of our very preliminary results on the proteolytic processing of protogadrin 19. This is the project that we started uh, last, so we don't have a lot of data on it, but we are progressing nicely. And it is uh, somehow related also to our ESC-derived analysis because we are using ESC-derived neurons as well to check what is going on with the proteolytic processing. So why did we get interested in this? Well, first of all, because of the reports uh, from uh, Joseph Getz's laboratory about the potential role of protagonin 19 in, in transcriptional regulation. So we thought, what is a membrane protein doing in the nucleus? This is, of course, not the first time that this has been described because there are other examples of members of the cadherin family that show the same um, effect. And also there is a, a very well-known gene that has nothing to do with addition, uh, with cadherins, which is called Notch, where this process has been very nicely explained. So apart from that, we had been looking at where within the cell protocadherin 19 is located. And what we found was if we express protocadherin 19 with a tag, with a little tag that will allow us to identify it in cell lines, we don't really see much of it or any at all in the nucleus. And uh, this is a bit difficult maybe to interpret, but what we do is we have the cells, we make them express this label protocadherin 19, and then we go to a microscope that allows us to do um, optical planes. So we get like a 3D reconstruction of the cell, and we can then check whether the red signal that we see in what would be the nucleus, which is the blue, is it really there, or is it above, or is it below, because cells are not that thick. So you must imagine that here is the membrane, here is the nucleus, and here is the cell membrane again. So potentially you could have protogadirin 19 either on the upper membrane or the lower membrane, and you might be able to see it and think it is in the nucleus. We did that and we didn't see much. Of course, we cannot rule it out because if there are very, very, very small amounts, we won't be able to detect it. However, if we express just the cytoplasmic domain of protocadirin 19, it goes into the nucleus and we don't see it elsewhere in the cell. And this is also to be expected because uh, if you run the intracellular domain sequence uh, on website that will give you uh, a prediction of where it goes to the cell, it detects nuclear localization signals. 
These were cell lines, though, and we're more interested in neurons. So what we did was take primary hippocampal neurons. So we take a mouse, we dissect the hippocampus, and we put those neurons in culture, and we know they express high levels of cytopathy. But because we cannot detect that one with antibodies, we made them express a fusion of protagonin 19 and the green fluorescent protein. What we see is because these cells are overexpressing, they have too much of the protein, so it cannot all go to the membrane. We see a lot of it in the cytoplasm around the nucleus. You can also faintly see how it goes into the processes, processes so it's going to the membrane, and we can see some green in the nucleus as well. However, this is not a confocal image, so we don't have the planes and we cannot check. What we did was take our ESL-derived neurons and transfect them with a full-length protocadrin 19 with the HA tag, and to be able to see the shape of the neuron, a green fluorescent protein that goes to the membrane. So with that, what we see is all the neurites of the neuron are labeled green, and we can see um, HA in red, and we see three things. One, which are the arrows, that protocadrin 19 is in these neurites, which would be expected. We also see a lot around the nucleus, which would be the yellow because it overlaps with the green. And then we also see dots in the nucleus again. And here we did the same thing. We look at all these planes and then imagine that where, we, where that red dot is, we kind of cut through the cell and then look from the side. And this is what you see uh, where it says Z view through the yellow line. What we see is that that red dot that seems to be in the nucleus, when you look in the in the vertical plane, so to say, it seems to be more outside, more on top of the nucleus than really inside. So with all of this, and also because uh, we had found these small size bands in our um, experiments with uh, detecting the protein, we came forward with an hypothesis that is that normally protocadrin 19 is at the cell membrane. And then because of some circumstances that we don't know yet, but I will show you in a moment, a protease that we believe might be from a particular family, which is the Adam family, cuts uh, the extracellular domain and it liberates this extracellular part and then the intracellular domain still stays at the membrane. And then there is a second protease that we believe it's the gamma secretase that will cut again and release the intracellular domain. And because this domain doesn't have a um, um, transmembrane domain anymore and it has nuclear localization signals, then it goes into the nucleus. And what we are trying to, to do to test this hypothesis is to play around with um, the activity of the proteases. So we try to either provide more protease to see if we get more of the intracellular domain, or we try to interfere with their function using inhibitors to see if we get less of the intracellular domain. And first we tried with one type of cell that it's called mouse embryonic fibroblast. Essentially, because we got them from uh, Professor Bart de Struper in Belgium, uh, we got a, a cell line that is a knockout for Adam-10, and we thought Adam-10 might be involved. So we took those cells, the normal MEFs and the knockout MEFs, and we gave them full-length protocadrin 19 to see what happened. You can see there are quantification that has no error bars because we haven't, we, we cannot really repeat this experiment. This would maybe suggest that Adam 10 is involved because there is a clear reduction in the intensity of the band that corresponds to the intracellular domain whenever this protease is missing. However, the important piece of information for me here is that this type of cell line doesn't seem to be able to process protocadrin 19 at all because the big dark blobs that you see at the top, this is the full length. So there is a lot of protein there for it to be processed. However, we don't really see uh, any small bands. So we did something else, which was overexpress either Adam-10 or Adam-17. So we're giving more of the protease to these cells, but we switched to a different cell line because we wanted it to be processed, which is uh, the HEC293 cells. So each of these lanes has protocadrin 19 full length that we have given to it, except for the last one, which is the control, and then either an excess of Adam-10 protease, an excess of Adam-17 protease, or no excess at all. And this one uh, has worked much better. We've been able to repeat this experiment several times and do our quantifications. And what we see is that when we give an excess of Adam-10 protease, we see a 1.4-fold increase in the levels of the intracellular domain. And this uh, difference is significant. When we give an excess of Adam-17 protease, it still increases, but only 1.2-fold, and that is not 
that difference is not significant. So that kind of would um, validate our hypothesis, but we're still not 100% sure because we've done it in neurons as well. And I will go, this is my last slide, so don't worry, I'm not going on and on and on. So let me see if I can, oh, perfect. So what we see here, these are control neurons. They were just sliced and we can detect this uh, band that because of the size, we believe it's the intracellular domain. Uh, these are controls to, uh, to account for the fact that when, give, when we give uh, inhibitors, we give a substance to the cell and we don't want that substance to do something and not the inhibitor itself. When we um, take these cells and um, increase the concentration of potassium chloride, I've shown this before, this, is, uh, this mimics neuronal activity and suddenly, this is this band here, we get a huge increase in the intensity of the intracellular domain. This is telling us that protocadurin-19 undergoes activity-dependent proteolytic cleavage. So when neurons are active, protocadurin-19 starts being cut and the intracellular domain is generated. We don't know yet what for, but this is what is happening. And then what we see is that if we give a gamma secretase inhibitor, there is still an increase, but it's only half. So that's why we believe gamma secretase is involved. And if you don't have it, or if you're blocking its, uh, if you block its activity, you, you cannot generate as much intracellular domain. However, this is what is worrying us because when we provide inhibitors that will um, affect ADAM10 and ADAM17, we don't see an effect at all. So what we're doing now is trying to uh, find a positive control to test because there are two options here. Either they're not involved at all or our inhibitors are not working. So this is what we're doing at the moment. So, oh, sorry, I forgot on the last one. And what, why do we care about this? Because we want to know what this intracellular domain is doing in neurons. And what we have done is, this is what we want to do. We want to have normal ESLs that we will differentiate into neurons. We have our knockout ESLs that we will differentiate into neurons. And we have created now a new type of ESLs um, in vitro that um, expresses the intracellular domain all the time. So we have not touched the original one, but in, a, in this locus that it's called ROSA26 that is very widely used to insert things into the mouse genome, we have added this um, protocadurin 19 intracellular domain tagged with uh, HA. And this is expressed um, from the beginning. So we can see what happens if, um, if ES cells express it all the time and we try to make neurons, is there something going on? And this will give us um, an indication of that because we're going to take samples of day two, day four, day eight, day 16 uh, neurons, and we will obtain RNA and we will compare because if we believe that the intracellular domain of protocadurin 19 has an effect regulating gene expression, if we force the expression of the intracellular domain, we might be able to find changes there. And this is just to show you that we have these. So these are eight different clones that we have uh, selected. And we can see this, um, this is an anti-HA antibody. So it only detects this one and not the endogenous one. And we can see it here. And this is the anti 19 antibody that, can, that detects the full length protein, but also this one here, which is this size, which uh, is the intracellular domain. So as a summary, what I wanted to, to show you today is that um, the neurons that express protocadurin 19 are not a homogeneous population, um, that our detailed analysis of the cortex, at least so far, shows no differences in number and location of projection neurons between wild-type uh, knockout and heterozygous females, that um, heterozygous females show a hypersensitivity to novel environments, that the response to KCL stimulation is, in, is decreased in knockout cells and also in wild type cells if they are co-cultured with the knockout cells. And that protocadurin 19 undergoes activity dependent proteolytic processing uh, mediated most probably by gamma secretase and potentially adam So with that, I want to thank everyone who's been involved in this work. So the members of my lab, Jessica, Natalia, Sylvia, and James, they have all contributed to the data that I have presented today. Uh, Bridget Allen helped us generate the protocadurin 19 knockout ESLs. Uh, Professor Paul Kemp and Oliver Steele have been um, and are helping us with electrophysiological studies beyond the calcium imaging. Uh, if the Yves Bart lab helped us establish the ESL culture and Stefan Baduin's lab has helped us with the behavior. And our funding at the moment comes from the Wellcome Trust, the Welsh Government and uh, 
the Protogallia in 1990. So thank you very much for your attention. I think we actually have time for one question. If, how about the yeah, yeah. Thank you. That was a, a beautiful talk. Um, I wanted to go to your third point about the females being um, hyper uh, sensitive to yeah. novel situations, and you'd sort of ask, what does that translate to in, in the human? And, and two thoughts came to mind, and I'm, I'm curious about your thoughts and others, and that is one memory, the memory test you can do, but the other thing is that um, children with PCDH19 do tend to have autistic features, some of them have the diagnosis, and one of the characteristics of autism is rigidity and poor transition. And I'm just I'm wondering if you're you're measuring them at a transition time and it's like I can't stand this with that if that might be the, the human correlate. Okay. Thank you. Um, so we have seen this very recently. Um, and one thing, so there are there is research that has been done into this type of behavior, into uh, increased uh, sensitivity to novel environment, and it seems to be mediated by cognitive pathways. So we are now uh, in the process of establishing a collaboration with people who do exactly that type of research. Which, luckily for us, there is one person in Cardiff. Um, so we will try to find out um, whether that's the case in our animals or not. Um, Rigidity, it, because this is happening mostly in the first five minutes. I don't know whether you can translate it into something as strong as rigid behavior. Because, well, I'm not an expert uh, in psychology, uh, but I would think that this is something that doesn't disappear after a quick um, time period. That it would be more subtle, and I would expect to see bigger differences in that case. But I cannot rule that out. So maybe just on that note, parents in the, in the room, rigidity, hypersensitivity to novel environments. Yes, no, maybe, any com I see a lot of heads shaking, obviously, yeah, so there's, it's, it's obviously very complex, so thank you.